Glad to have you all here. Before turning on the Zoom interpretation feature, we will start consecutive interpretation. Hola, bienvenidas y bienvenidos a la reunión estatal de septiembre de la campaña de la gente pobre. Estamos muy contentos de tenerles aquí hoy. Antes de activar la función de interpretación de Zoom, comenzaremos con interpretación consecutiva. Our meeting is bilingual, Spanish and English. I want to introduce our interpreters, Carla and Weber. Please come off mute and say hello. Nuestra reunión es en español y en inglés. Nos gustaría presentar a nuestros intérpretes, Carla, Carla y Weber. Por favor, saluden. Hola, muchos saludos a todos. Mi nombre es Carla Guerrero Montero y estoy en Delaware. Greetings everyone, my name is Carla Guerrero Montero and I am located in Delaware. Hi everyone, buenas tardes, mi nombre es Weber y estoy en la ciudad de Chicago. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Weber and I'm in the city of Chicago. Thank you. Now we will make our interpretation announcement, first in English, then in Spanish. Listen carefully because there are instructions that everyone will have to follow. Ay, perdón, sorry, mute, <laughs> disculpen que me puse en mute. Gracias. Ahora haremos nuestro anuncio de interpretación, primero en inglés y luego en español. Eh, favor, escuchar con atención que habrán instrucciones. Okay. The Wisconsin Poor People's Campaign understands the strategic importance of and is committed to creating multilingual spaces when possible. We are organizing across all divisions, all lines of division, including language. To that end, we have interpretation in Spanish and English. We will ask that all participants speak slowly and clearly. Right after this announcement, we will activate the Zoom interpretation feature. Parts of our meeting will be in English and other parts in Spanish. So everyone, please make sure to follow these instructions. If you are using Zoom from your computer, you will see a globe icon at the bottom of your screen. Click on the globe and select your preferred language. If you're using Zoom from your phone, click on the three dots where it says choose language interpretation and select your preferred language. If you have any problems doing this, please comment on the chat so that one of our members can assist you. Thank you. La campaña de la gente pobre de Wisconsin entiende la importancia estratégica y tiene la firme determinación de crear un espacio multilingüe y de unirnos eh, en lenguaje. Con esta finalidad tenemos interpretación en español e inglés. Le pedimos a todos los participantes que hablen lentamente y de forma clara. Al terminar este anuncio, activaremos la función de interpretación de Zoom. Si está usando Zoom en su computadora, verá un icono de un mundo en la parte de abajo de su pantalla. Haga clic en el mundo y seleccione el lenguaje de su preferencia. Si está usando Zoom desde su teléfono, haga clic en los tres puntitos donde dice More o Más y seleccione Language Interpretation o Interpretación de Idiomas. Y después, su lenguaje. Si tiene algún problema, ponga un comentario en el chat y le ayudaremos. Gracias. Okay, so... One, one second, let, let me check. Eh, en el canal de español... Eh, por favor, Carla, ¿puedes hablar? Perfecto, te escucho. Y Weber, ¿puedes hablar? Habla un poco más recio, por favor, Weber. Sí, te escuchamos. Perfecto. Ok. Thank the you. Globe, the globe should appear now at the bottom of your screen and the ability to, to hit those three dots as well. We'll just give a moment for people to get set up. If you have any issues, please note them in the chat and we'll be starting in just a moment. Okay. Thank you to our interpreters and tech team. And a special welcome to anyone who is new to the Poor People's Campaign. If this is your first meeting with us, we are glad you are here and we are eager to get to know you and learn what brought you to our campaign, to the campaign. My name is Michael Morgan. I'm a member of our coordinating committee and I'll be co-emceeing the meeting 
for tonight, along with my friend and another leader of the Poor People's Campaign, Bruce Growl. The focus of tonight's meeting will be on our for-profit healthcare system. Following our, our land recognition and invocation, we will have an opportunity for a one-on-one -on -one discussion in which our Poor People's Campaign members can share their own experiences with the for-profit healthcare system and also share our visions for what the system should look like. Y compartir nuestras visiones sobre cómo debería aparecer el sistema. To the PPC. Following that, we have a discussion about the history of the development of our profit, our for-profit healthcare system, and this will be led by Avery Book of the Nonviolent Medicaid Army. Next, we'll learn about the NVMA's week of action and the activities that are centered around it. And then we will turn to the members of the PPC around the state who will share their plans for actions and events. Finally, we'll share with you about ways that you might be able to get involved and participate in this important week of action. Before we get started, we want to ask everyone to use the naming feature to help us identify you if this is your first PPC statewide meeting by adding an asterisk to your name. We are going to be having an orientation for new folks later on, and that asterisk will help us know not to assign you to a separate breakout room. Please take a minute now to add an asterisk by your name um, by going to the participants location on your screen, click on your name, it's a right click for Windows, and selecting rename, and then add the asterisk. And with that, we will now begin with an invocation and land recognition by Sarah. Hi, everybody. Wonder oh, I turned my video on. Sorry, didn't realize it was off. It's great to be with you all tonight. Um, my name is Sarah. I'm a member of the Wisconsin Poor People's Campaign, and I live in Milwaukee. Um, as Michael said, we're going to begin tonight with a, a brief invocation. Um, you can take this time uh, to ground yourself as you wish. Could be to pray, meditate, reflect. Um, we're going to start off by acknowledging the land that we're on a land of broken promises and forced removal of people. We acknowledge that genocide happened and in many ways is still happening. Indigenous people are not relics of the past. They are here, still offering us their talents and stories. This is their land in past, present, and future. So we want to respectfully acknowledge the Bad River Band of Lake Superior Chippewa, Ho-Chunk Nation, Black Court Oriel Band of Lake Superior Chippewa, Lac de Flambeau, um, Band of Lake Superior Chippewa, Menominee Tribe of Wisconsin, Oneida Nation, Forest County Potawatomi, Red Cliff Band of Lake Superior Chippewa, St. Croix Chippewa, Sakaugan Chippewa of Mole Lake, and the Stockbridge Muncie, in addition to other non-federally recognized tribes. They have stewarded this land throughout the generations. And thank you also to Reverend Ari who um, helped uh, compile this list to, to recognize. This month, our statewide meeting falls at a very holy time for Jewish people. Um, I'm Jewish, <laughs> and I want to share that um, about a week ago, we celebrated Rosh Hashanah, and in a couple more days, we're going to be celebrating Yom Kippur. We call these 10 days in between the days of awe. These days are a time for reflection, realignment, for taking stock of ourselves in the past year and preparing ourselves to enter the new year. It is also the time when the Torah calls for Jubilee, releasing of debts, freeing of all who are bound and rest for the land and all who work it. We see the new year as an opportunity to start fresh, recalibrating ourselves and our relationships to our core beliefs, um, particularly in the importance of human life and dignity for all people. So with this fresh start at our new year, um, we do many things, but one thing we do is that we say a special prayer that's called the Shehekianu. It's a prayer that is for firsts. Um, so we say it in different times of the year, like maybe when um, a new baby is born or the first day of a new job. I'm gonna slow down, sorry, everybody. Sorry, interpreters. <laughs> it's always the people who sometimes do interpretation who go the fastest. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, um, 
so yeah, it's a, it's a prayer that we say for firsts. And around this time of the year, though, because it's a new year, everything is a first. It's the first of, of many things in this new year. Um, and so we say it over and over again for lots of things that might feel kind of mundane. But the words of the prayer basically offer thanks for being alive and sustained and for making it to this moment to experience this first, whatever it is. Um, and since this is our first Poor People's Campaign statewide meeting in the Jewish year of 5782 that we're in now, um, I wanted to share the Shehekianu with you all to just give thanks um, that we are all here together, that we've been sustained to make it to this moment so that we can organize and build this movement together and do this work for a moral revolution of values um, so that we may all have our human rights. So I'm gonna share that prayer now. Baruch Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Shehekianu V'kiyamanu V'higiyanu L'azman hazeh Amen. Thank you, Sarah. In preparation for our participation in the Nonviolent Medicaid Army Week of Action, which is going on right now, our meeting will be focused on healthcare. We're going to start off tonight's meeting a little differently than usual. We'll begin with our meeting with a testimony from Joyce of Weston, Wisconsin. She will share with us about how her family has been impacted by the current healthcare system that serves profit makers rather than patients. Joyce shared her story as part of the we Won't Be Silent Anymore project that launched last month. We are starting with a testimony to root us in the human toll that these systems take and prepare us to share our own stories. And Nate will be starting that in just a moment. Oops, not, wait, not that slide deck. Just a moment, please. Okay, hey, you're on, Joyce. Okay. Uncle Kenny, who is 94 years old, has walked beside me my entire life. He and his wife, along with their four boys, provided a respite from my turbulent home life when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. Uncle Kenny and his wife, Ellen, shared their love of books with me as a young girl. Uncle Kenny grew up during the Depression on a small farm in Douglas County. Several years ago, after his wife Ellen died, Uncle Kenny wrote a short memoir of those years on the farm. He remembered how hard he and his family worked, especially during the hot and stressful days of weaning season. Mm. He shared his love for his hard-working parents. His mother worked alongside him doing the twice daily milking of about 40 uh, dairy cows wow. before the days of milking machines. He's got a funny story in there too. <laughs> His mother would weave red, red rugs on her homemade loom and to make some money for the family and also delivered Montgomery Ward catalogs. <laughs> to people in the area with her other son who drove the car filled with catalogs. Uncle Kenny provided for his family as he worked numerous jobs throughout his long life. He worked for the Burlington Northern Railroad in Superior, the U.S. Steel Plant in Duluth until it closed in 1981 
during the recession that hit the country. Mm -hmm. It was devastating to Uncle Kenny, his family, and to the area with so many people out of work. He worked at UW Superior, keeping the boilers that heated the campus in good repair. Uncle Kenny finally found a job in Two Harbors, Minnesota, which was over an hour away from where he lived. He often had to drive through blizzards because he worked at the night shift oh, and on icy roads, you know, two lane curvy roads. Trains filled with taconite from the open mm. pit iron ore mines on the Misabi Range needed to have the taconite transferred from the moving trains by machines operated by people like Uncle Kenny onto the huge long ore docks where the taconite would then be loaded onto the ore boats that brought the taconite to steel mills in Ohio and Pennsylvania. During those years, Uncle Kenny worked with his dad, Consta, his uncle Charlie, and his sons in the woods, also making hay and other part-time jobs. Now that Uncle Kenny is 94 Jeez. years old, he tells me that he has outlived his savings. He continues to live in his old farmhouse, which needs some work. He mows his own lawn and cooks for himself. Uncle Kenny can no longer afford the cost of supplemental insurance to Medicare. He hasn't seen a dentist for many years. He continues to crawl up and down the steep steps to the basement to keep the wood burning furnace going to save fuel costs. He needed a new furnace last year and thankfully I was able to mm. help him financially with paying for the new gas furnace. Now the state of Wisconsin is telling Uncle Kenny and the residents that they will need to replace their septic systems with new septic systems at a cost of about $7,000. Uncle Kenny tells me maybe he won't live that long. <laughs> Uncle Kenny has worked hard and has lived a long, full life. He shouldn't have to worry about health care costs to add to other worries he is facing at mm -hmm. the end of his life. Affordable health care should be available to everyone at any age. I also suggest that we should be expanding Social Security and Medicare so that they are covering people who are going to be living longer. Very moving testimony from Joyce. Next, for anyone who is new, we have an orientation here in the main room. We're going to set up breakout rooms for ongoing members to share your experiences with a current for-profit healthcare system like Joyce did, and your vision for how a healthcare system based on healthcare as a human right would look. This is also an opportunity to get another member, get to know another member of the Poor People's Campaign of Wisconsin. Okay, so just um, one more time, if if you um, are planning to be in the um, orientation, I have, um, you have put the, the asterisk or the star by your name. So I have not put you in a breakout room, but everybody else you are, I'm about to send you to connect with someone. Um, if you have any issues like right off, just, you know, if nobody shows up and you're by yourself or anything like that happens, that doesn't work out, please go ahead and message in the chat. Um, and we will try to get it figured out. Um, I think you might, I'm going to open the rooms, but I think you will have to click to actually go and we'll come back in about 15 minutes.
Okay, I think, I think everybody has successfully made their way to their breakout rooms. That was, oh, uh, Justice doesn't have anyone. Um, I think maybe Nijmi is not on yet or not going to one. So I will move. Okay. Okay. Nati, I think we are. Oh, hold on, Brittany, I will send you. Hello. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. I have not yet been allocated to breakout room oh um is this your first hello first of all is this your first poor people's campaign statewide meeting or no yes please okay so we are going to actually have you stay here we're going to give um a bit of an orientation um for for new folks to the to the organization so thank you all right i think all right natalia do you uh i'm try one sec okay sorry I, my computer was um recently upgraded and it's asking me to give privacy settings allowing sorry it's okay why don't i go ahead and just start the screen share i just might need your help prompting yeah. okay it looks like uh rose is possibly alone in oh room. yes what? let me One. let me move move rose with someone sorry okay nate if you don't mind just keeping an eye on that that would be helpful thank you yeah i'll, I'll do that wonderful Okay, hi everybody. Welcome to the orientation to the uh, Wisconsin Poor People's Campaign. We just like to give an opportunity if this is, oh, Brittany, did you wanna go? Sorry, I thought I had tried to, do you wanna just stay for this? Yeah, I mean, if somebody's missing a partner, you can send me if somebody okay. needs to be paired up, otherwise I'll stay. Perfect, thank you. Yeah. So first of all, um, everybody who's here, welcome. We're so excited that you're at your first um, Poor People's Campaign statewide meeting. It's wonderful to have you here. Um, and I'm going to, we'll go kind of through this quick so that if you actually have questions, we have time to get to those. Um, we just wanted to get, we just like to try to give an opportunity if it's your first Poor People's Campaign meeting to learn some of the basics about the campaign so that you're not just kind of jumping into everything else that we're doing. So um, if you want to type into the chat um, your name and where you live, where you're joining us from, um, and if you also want to, you could say how you heard about the Poor People's Campaign. We'd love to know. Um, and if we have time, we'll do a little bit of sharing. Um, so first, we just want to share with you that the Poor People's Campaign has comes from um, a really important history, um, beginning um, with the first Poor People's Campaign, which was launched in 1968 by Martin Luther King, um, along with many other leaders from across the country, from many different communities, um, including the fight for welfare rights, for indigenous rights, um, Latinos organizing in different parts of the Southwest and other parts of the country, poor white folks who were organizing, and many, many more. Um, and that that is the, the history and the lineage that we come from and that we see ourselves as really picking up the baton from, um, from that original campaign. Um, would anybody be willing to read the quote that's on here actually? This is a quote of, you know, that sort of speaks to the original campaign. I can read it. Thank you, Kaylee. Awesome. Yeah. And welcome. The dispossessed of this nation, the poor, both white and Negro, live in a cruelly unjust society. They must organize a revolution against the injustice, not against the lives of the persons who are their fellow citizens, but against the structures through which the society is refusing to take means which have been called for and which are at hand to lift the load of poverty. 
There are millions of poor people in this country who have very little or even nothing to lose. If they can be helped to take action together, they will do so with a freedom and a power that will be a new and unsettling force in our complacent national life. Thank you so much, Kaylee. So there's a lot in that quote um, and we'll return to it. We return to this quote and many more, uh, many times, but um, just wanna especially lift up that um, we often talk about this new and unsettling force and that that is what we're building in the Poor People's Campaign. Um, so it might look different than, um, than other, some other work or some other organizations um, because we are trying to build something really for the long haul um, to change things all the way from the roots. Oop. Um, did I miss one? I think Natalia, are you gonna do this one? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So hi everybody, I am Natalia. I'm part of the coordinating committee of the Poor People's Campaign. And so the current version of the Poor People's Campaign was launched in 2018. Um, that doesn't mean that there was no work happening in those 50 years, right? There was a lot of uh, movement work occurring, including in groups like the National Union of the Homeless and in many other spaces that built the base for what we have today. Um, the campaign is based on the fact that it's it's not widely shared and it's actually downplayed, but that there are over 140 million people that are poor in this country or that are one uh, paycheck away from being poor. Um, that's much higher than you'll see uh, in, the, in the data that's shared. And actually, um, this is before the pandemic. So we know that the number is even greater. And we challenge what it means to be poor, right? What, what does that mean to be poor? There's notions of extreme poverty and that's kind of what's in our head for poverty from what is fed to us in the media. But we know that it includes also the people that are barely okay, right? Folks that are uh, a loss of income, an injury, a new mouth to feed ahead, uh, away um, from, from being in an unstable and, and uh, devastating conditions. And the campaign is uh, growing a nationwide movement and even international. So right now we're in 40 states, I'm sorry, 42 states and growing, but we also um, have links and work with folks that are abroad in other, in other spaces outside the US, such as in Mexico. We can go to the next. So we're gonna see a short video about what the campaign is about. Um, and if folks would like to put in the chat what resonates with you, what you can connect to from what you're going to hear. You might have to reshare with sound. Sorry. In Wall Street, can you all hear it or no? doesn't say a yes. thing yes. about what's happening on the real streets of America. Everybody has a right, has a right. To, live. to live. The Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival, has come up with a series of demands. I know that you are here for the same reason we all are here to put our elected officials on notice. The pain and the discontent is real, and the demands of our movement are moral. We know what we want to focus on. Our agenda is clear. We demand an immediate implementation of federal and state living wage laws. We demand, we demand the, right the right for all workers to form and join unions. Form and join unions. We, demand we demand equal pay, equal pay for, equal work. for equal work. We demand, we demand a guaranteed annual income. We demand fully funded anti-poverty programs that protect the welfare of us all. We demand the expansion of Medicaid in every state. We want single payer university health care, not for some, but for everybody. Of the Voting Rights Act. We demand an end 
to racist gerrymandering. We want early registration of 17 and 18 year olds. We want registration to vote at age 18. If we can be drafted for war at 18, we ought to be able to vote automatically at 18. Early voting in every state, same day registration, and the enactment of election day as a holiday. We demand a reversal of state laws that prevent municipalities from raising minimum wage. We demand an end to mass incarceration and the continuing inequalities of black, brown, and poor white people with the criminal justice system. We demand the right to vote for the formerly incarcerated. A clear and just immigration system. This includes providing a timely citizenship process that guarantees the right to vote. The First Nation Native American and Alaskan Native people retain their tribal recognition as a nation, not a race. We demand decent housing. We demand relief from crushing household student and consumer debt. We demand equity in education. We demand an end to the resegregation of schools. We demand free tuition at public colleges and universities, and an end to profiteering on student debt. <laughs> Equitable funding for historically black colleges and universities. We demand the repeal of the 2017 federal tax law. And we demand that the wealthy and corporations Pay their, Pay their fair share. We demand an end to military aggression and warmongering. We demand a stop to privatization of military budget and any increase in military spending. We demand a ban on assault rifles and a ban on the easy access of firearms. We demand an end to federal programs that send military equipment into local and state communities. We demand that the call to build a wall at the U.S.-Mexico border be ceased. We demand a ban on fracking, mountaintop removal, coal mining, coal ash ponds, and offshore drilling. Ooh. Oh, no. I'm sorry. What? So sorry. Coal ash ponds and offshore drilling. We demand a ban on all new pipelines, refineries, and coal, oil, and gas export terminals. We are demanding that we stop the war on our poor. Somebody's hurting my brother. Somebody's hurting our sisters. And it's gone on far too long. And we won't be silent anymore. We believe, we believe that we can win. We believe that we can win. We believe that everybody, everybody has a right, has a right to live, to live, to live, to live, to live. Awesome. So yeah, we, we like to share this video because it, it lets us see the, you know, the campaign visually and, um, and also see a little bit about how we organize. We just wanted to share a couple of other things. Um, and I won't go through all of these, but I'll say that I'll, I'll just say some highlights. You know, we really believe in building from the power or building power from the bottom up. Um, our movement is led um, by people who are impacted in many different ways, which is really most of us. Um, and, um, and we're building this movement ourselves, you know, here in Wisconsin, we don't have any, um, anybody who's, who's on, who's, you know, for whom this is their job. We're all, it's very grassroots. We're all building, um, building this movement, um, because it's a movement that we know we need for our families and our communities. Um, I'll say too that one of the, our, 
the things that we think about a lot is building leadership across all lines of division. So um, we build across many of the lines that divide us. You know, here in Wisconsin, we know that there's often a great divide between the big cities and rural areas. Um, definitely racism divides us deeply. Um, gender, all, across all genders, across all religions, we are building this movement um, together. And, um, and, and that is an important critical part of how, how we're building the Poor People's Campaign. Um, a question that often comes up too is about, uh, is that, that we are politically independent. This means partly that we are nonpartisan, so we do not endorse candidates or political parties or support um, one party or another, or, um, or like I said, any candidates, but also, um, you know, we think about this idea of being politically independent, that we also are, are building political power that is not just not directly endorsing those political parties, but also not, not there to just give them power to then decide things for poor and impacted people. We're building power um, with our own agenda, an agenda that comes out of the real crises that our communities um, are facing. Um, I think we'll actually just get through the last couple slides and then do some questions. Thank you, Sada. Um, very briefly, I, I want to emphasize too what, what Sarah said about the political independence. It's also realizing that political is beyond electoral, right? That the work that we do on the building of the strength of the leadership of the poor and the success is because to make um, real change, deep change, things, you know, our, our uh, strength has to be beyond elections and that we're more than numbers um, for a specific candidate. So just very, very briefly about the Poor People's Campaign in Wisconsin. Uh, like the national campaign started in 2018 with the 40, uh, days of action in Madison. Um, and it was, I went through some transition and it had a, a kind of a relaunching in 2020. So in the middle of the pandemic, uh, we held uh, online forums about essential workers in Wisconsin and um, not just the impacts and the injustices that they were facing, but also connecting it in the way that the video was connecting, interconnecting uh, the injustices, the, the systemic injustices that we face. Also um, connecting with issues on the ground like Fight for 15, uh, also holding a march on as part of the National Medicaid, Nonviolent Medicaid Army in Madison last year. I know um, some folks are new here, but some, some were there as well. So we held a, an important march about a year ago in Madison, demanding um, Medicaid for all. And also this year, we have uh, delivered our congressional resolution uh, pushing those demands. We've also sent delegates to DC, including me, to be part of the season of direct action in Washington, DC. Um, and we continue to build locally as well. Just very, very, very briefly, these are some of the uh, existing committees that we have in different kind of shapes and form, but we have some um, kind of thematic based committees, as you can see at the top. We also have some regional groups those are the ones that are existing in this moment. Uh, we would love to form and be completely statewide. So if you're interested and you don't see um, your, your county or your area here, please, uh, and you would like help in, in getting a group of, of you all together in your community, let us know. Or if you are from one of these areas, um, please reach out to join your regional committee. And then we also are formed by partner organizations, um, such as the ones that are listed here. Awesome. And there are many, many ways um, to get involved. Oh, I'm sorry, we didn't update this before we did this, but um, these monthly statewide meetings are a great way to kind of connect and know what's going on statewide. But we would love for people to, from these statewide meetings, um, really find a home in the campaign. Our regional committees and our um, statewide work committees are really a way to um, be building the campaign um, and all of the activities of the campaign. So um, we have a get involved form that I will share a link to when we get back. Um, I'll share that link in the chat. Um, you can also just email us at wisconsin at poorpeoplescampaign.com or .org, sorry. Um, and um, you can join us for 
Um, what this should actually say is the nonviolent Medicaid Army Week of Action um, events that are coming up very soon um, on Saturday that we're going to be talking about for the rest of, of the evening. But we would love to see everybody, um, you know, find, find a home with a local committee um, or a statewide work committee to be able to really begin taking action um, and helping build this campaign across the state. Um, are there any questions that people have? We just have a couple minutes. I'm gonna announce on the chat that we have um, just a couple minutes, but maybe Nati, if you could field any questions. Um, and, and, and actually we have folks coming back to the main room and interpretation is needed because oh. people finished early. So actually if tech could please uh, restore interpretation and Weber, are you okay continuing to interpret? Can I see a thumbs up? Okay, I see you speaking. Excellent. Um, y Abigail, ya pronto va a aparecer interpretación de nuevo en la pantalla. It's still on. Uh, sometimes you have to turn it back on when you come back from a breakout room, I notice. But, okay. um, Weber, ¿puedes hablar, por favor? No te escucho. I'm sorry, orientation folks. This was the first time that we tried um, doing a uh, doing the, the breakouts this way. And I think the time was a little shorter and it, we clearly just need a few more minutes. So I'm sorry that we, I think as people are coming back, we're just going to have, have to, um, kind of move forward. I'm so sorry. Hopefully if you do have questions, please reach out on to, um, to our email or on that get involved form. We would love to talk through any of this stuff with you. Um, and yeah, so sorry, but thank you for joining us for the orientation. Um, may I ask just, just one quick second, uh, Weber, no te escucho. No sé por qué veo que te mueves, pero no te escucho. Déjame ver si te escucho en el canal de español. ¿Estás en el canal de español, Weber? O no te escucho. Sure, I'm trying the English one now. Can you hear me in English? In English, I can. Yeah. Okay, can you try the Spanish again, please? No, I can't hear it. Um, one, one quick second. Abigail, ¿escuchas la interpretación? Sí, 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 lo escucho. Okay, perfecto. Okay, está funcionando. It's working, thank you. Okay, next, we're going to go to the next part of our program. Um, looking at a political consciousness and I'm turning this over now to Bruce Grau. Bruce? You know, Michael, I don't know if everybody has made it back from their breakout rooms yet. Ah, I think they need a few okay. more. Sure. Yeah, a few people are still out there, I think. All right, everybody should be back now. Okay, well, I hope that the discussions you had on the one-on-ones or as well as with the um, orientation were uh, informative and helpful. Unfortunately, we don't have time to do a discussion of the results of some of your uh, discussions, but hopefully these were fruitful for you. Next, we're gonna turn uh, the meeting over to Bruce Grau, who will talk about our politi political consciousness raising. Um, so Bruce. Thanks, Michael. Yeah, I'm Bruce Grau. I'm, uh, I live here in Wausau and a member of the statewide coordinating committee for the Poor People's Campaign of Wisconsin. And we're joined tonight by leaders from the nonviolent Medicaid Army. We're going to start with a political consciousness raising piece to review the development of our healthcare system as it transformed from prioritizing people's needs to those of the profiteers at the expense of our health, livelihoods, and quality of life. Parroting the OJs, instead of doing good things with the mean green, too many people do bad things with it. Following the presentation from Avery, we'll open up the floor to discussion and reflection. And while you're listening to Avery, I'd like you to consider two, two questions. One is, how does it make you feel to hear what he's talking about? And number two, try to think what it would be like for you if 
if healthcare was considered a right and not a commodity to be traded on the market. So after that discussion, we'll hear from uh, Nijmi Zurinko, who's also from the Nonviolent Medicaid Army uh, and local Wisconsin PPC leaders about the Nonviolent Medicaid Army Week of Action. Right now, it's my pleasure to introduce Avery Book from the Nonviolent Medicaid Army, and he'll provide us the history of the development of US healthcare. Thanks, Avery. Thank you, Bruce, and thank you all for having Excuse me here. It's really may I great. Offer one second for interpretation switch, interpreter switching, sure. please. Perfecto. Gracias. Thank you. Um, really, yeah, just really, really grateful to be here with you all. Um, I'm Avery Book with the Nonviolent Medicaid Army and um, the Vermont Worker Center. I, I live in Thetford, Vermont. Uh, Happy to be visiting from the other other dairy state. Um, so just a little bit of context. Uh, this presentation comes from a broader series of, of political education we've, we've done with the National Nonviolent Medicaid Army, looking at healthcare and the history of grassroots struggles of the poor and dispossessed. Um, I'm so sorry, Avery, to interrupt. I'm so sorry. I think we're having sound issues. Carla, it sounds kind of broken up. Maybe it's the headphones you're using. Could you please? Or do you have headphones handy, maybe? For some reason, it breaks up. One second. Thank you, everybody, for understanding. No sé qué es, pero es como que se sube y baja mientras. Thank you, everybody. Creo que está mucho mejor, sí. Muchas gracias, Carla. Thank you, Avery. Are we, are we good? Okay, great. Um, yes, speed of liberation. Taking the time we need for this to work for us all. Um, so yeah, just this specifically, this, this presentation looks at the history of, of our healthcare system and how it's connected to um, the history of this country around automation and deindustrialization and some sort of deeper fundamental shifts in the economy um, and how all that has affected our experience of and, and struggle for healthcare. And just FYI, um, a lot of this comes from this really great book I recommend um, called The Next Shift by Gabriel Manaz. I can put that in the chat later as well. Uh, can we go to the next slide? Uh, there we go. There have been many moments throughout history when uh, the working class and the foreign dispossessed have fought for universal health care. Immediately after World War II, uh, about 35% of the US population, um, so at that time that was about 14 million workers, were unionized. And compare that to, to, to today, um, just under 11% are unionized. This relatively strong labor movement fought for universal health care. But eventually, given the battle they were up against in other contexts, they settled on the employer-based health insurance uh, model that we're, we're probably a lot of us are familiar with um, through their collective bargaining agreements. And this is an example of what some people describe as, as sort of a public-private welfare state that emerged after World War II um, with employer-based insurance plans subsidized by the federal government as tax-exempt income um, in some ways, this is similar to the ways in which the federal government incentivized working class and middle class home ownership by subsidizing um, mortgage mortgage interest. Um, this so so all these unionized workers having access to health care through um, health insurance led to the massive expansion of of health insurance companies and health care provision more generally. Previous to this, hospitals were were kind of where people, poor people went to die. And now, as, as enormous demand was created through this unionized workforce at the core of the industrial economy, hospitals became community institutions. They had this strong community spirit and workers offer a feeling, you know, the sense of, of, of ownership and entitlement to, to be able to use them. Many of the union contracts and the plans they had allowed for months of recovery after major surgeries and illnesses um, in, in hospital beds. 
uh, which, which for me is almost just hard to imagine that having had experiences getting uh, quickly rushed out of the recovery room. Uh, it's worth noting that private and nonprofit hospital workers in this period were excluded from the right to form unions up until the 1970s and were a low wage workforce that was providing care work to meet the healthcare needs of unionized members of their communities. You can go to the next slide, please. But this, uh, which you could call kind of a class compromise um, between the workers and the corporations had unintended consequences. As the healthcare sector grew both in overall size and then in the intensity and the quality of the care to meet the demand for insured unionized industrial workers, it drove up healthcare prices out of the reach of many other sections of the working class, particularly non-unionized poor people and el uh, elders. The, um, it's also worth noting that this public-private collective bargaining-centered healthcare excluded major sections of the country, such as the South, but the federal government, local state governments, and Wall Street essentially were coming together to maintain this low-wage, non-unionized, racially segregated workforce. So in this moment, in the, in the 60s, movements of organized elders and organized poor people fought for their inclusion in healthcare, leading to the passage of Medicare and Medicaid in 1965. And organizers in the civil rights movement also raised the cry for health care. Um, they just saw really horrific inequities in, in their work uh, throughout the South. And they organized experiments such as the Mon Bayou Clinic in the Mississippi Delta that offered health care services, child care. Sorry, Eric, can you slow down a little bit, please? Yep. Slow down. Thank you so much. Uh, food production, transportation, and legal services. And it's um, worth noting that many of these health clinics uh, of this period served as models for what are now the federally qualified health centers, um, of which there are about 1,400 of the, uh, throughout the US serving people on Medicaid who are, on, who are uninsured. And again, these reforms had massive positive impacts for um, previously excluded section of the community, but again, there were unintended consequences. Let's go to the next slide. This is probably a familiar sight to, to a lot of people in a lot of parts of the country. Um, we think of the Rust Belt and we often think of parts of the Northeast and, and a lot of the Midwest, but this is actually Birmingham, Alabama. And I think it's, it's worth um, Noting that people, the poor and dispossessed working class communities all over this country have, have felt the impact of deindustrialization and automation. Um, so, the period after Medicare and Medicaid were enacted, Medicare in particular represented an enormous, virtually bottomless source of public funds flowing into the private healthcare sector. And up until the 1980s, Medicare reimbursements were based on what's called a cost plus formula. So basically any procedure would be reimbursed for whatever the cost of it was, plus oftentimes like 1%, so um, guaranteed reimbursement and profit. Uh, and this led to another wave of massive expansion and also led to um, the beginnings of Wall Street really getting interested in involving itself in, in the healthcare sector. With the guarantees of public reimbursement, through uh, programs like Medicare and Medicaid, many hospitals turn to debt for expansion uh, and nonprofit and public hospitals had the advantage of being able to issue tax exempt municipal bonds. So cheaper for them and then cheaper for the, the lenders. Um, the lenders can make more money that way. They wouldn't have to spend as much on taxes. This period, 1965 up through the early eighties also saw the first wave of impacts of the microelectronics revolution. So this technological revolution enabled both automation uh, and globalization and resulted in massive disruption of industrial employment with millions of people across the country being laid off with nowhere to go, either piecing together marginal low wage employment or becoming permanently unemployed. Um, in this period, Racism, oftentimes in both the unions and by the employers, meant that African Americans and other workers of color, color were usually the first to be laid off, but white workers were often only a few years behind. And as all these industrial centers turned into rust belts, um, this massive dislocation also led to 
health problems. Studies have shown that in, in um, or Rust Belt deindustrialized areas, there have been rises in heart disease, chronic stress, suicide rates go up, malnutrition, domestic violence, depression, along with physical ailments that are associated with particular kinds of employment, such as black lung among coal miners and other, other specific uh, ailments based on employment. And so you saw this aging and increasingly injured and, and essentially disabled section of the working class that needs long-term care. And in this context, the, the healthcare sector, the growing healthcare sector served as sort of a shock absorber, both providing some care for these growing needs within these de decimated communities and by drawing some of the working class into those healthcare jobs. And uh, sometimes it was those former workers in, in the factories, which are disproportionately male, but oftentimes it was women in the family who are now taking on the work of working as healthcare workers. And in some cases, it was both. Um, people, there was a, the rise of two income families in this period. So uh, the next slide, please. So by the late 70s, the US federal and, and state level governments began to respond to the impact of deindustrialization and automation uh, through massive cuts to state programs. Um, healthcare program, uh, healthcare spending through Medicare and Medicaid had grown enormously since it was founded in, in 1965. And in 1983, austerity essentially, they tried to bring austerity to, to, to Medicare um, and they changed the reimbursement formula. So remember before it was cost plus. Now what they did is they basically took hundreds and hundreds of medical procedures and, and categorized them or so moved them along the spectrum um, with discrete costs associated with each of them. Um, and while their intent with this was to control costs, this, this is really profound in terms of the commodification of healthcare. Each, some per, the procedures became more valuable or costly depending on your perspective. If you're a healthcare profiteer, it's valuable. Um, than others, and private insurers quickly followed suit, followed the example of Medicare. And this resulted really in a huge chasm in healthcare. Larger hospitals, many of them university affiliated, began to specialize in those expensive medical procedures, transplants, expensive surgeries. Um, some of them became world renowned. You have people flying over the world to come to say, like the Cleveland Clinic, for example. Um, and this means it's been over time more these big hospitals move towards these capital intensive medical in interventions with ever more expensive equipment and specialized wings. Um, and again, this is driven more and more by, by debt um, and, and finance from Wall Street, who are you know, still being reassured uh, that it would be reimbursed by the public and private payers of these expensive procedures. And, and again, this, this is when you see kind of almost like the production line model of healthcare begin to, 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 to rise where you have the, the goal was that as many beds filled as possible for quick intensive procedures, then pushing patients out for outpatient or home-based long-term care. And meanwhile, smaller community hospitals in poor communities, whether that was uh, you know, poor Rust Belt towns or, or smaller towns or rural hospitals, poorer neighborhoods, they oftentimes just closed down or they were absorbed by these growing hospital networks. Um, and as hospitals became the site where these expensive medical interventions happened, um, the long-term care, that need was met by growing massive growth in, growth in nursing homes, home care, outpatient care, um, to attend to those needs because it was increasingly no longer happening in hospitals. Um, Nursing homes and home care overwhelmingly depend on Medicaid funding. And over the years, cuts to Medicaid have meant that those reimbursement rates tend to be much lower than Medicare and private insurance. Uh, and the combination of that with really limitation, like you know, the hospitals and other employers haven't figured out a way to automate that real kind of human to human care work. So that means that instead, there's an incentive to drive down wages, put into place unsafe staff to patient ratios and, and generally cut corners, which in nursing homes means often awful conditions for patients and for workers. The next slide. Excuse me, Avery, may, may I interrupt, please? Oh, yeah. Sorry. Mm -hmm. 
Um, Carla, I'm sorry, we continue to have um, issues with audio, so I think I can actually take over interpreting for the rest uh, of Avery's presentation and the Nishmi's, um, and if whoever can hop on afterwards, if that works for folks. Cool. Um, Nate, could you please make me interpreter? Thank you, everybody. And thank you so much, Carla, and thank you so much, Weber. Are you ready, Natalia? No, one sec. Um, okay. I'm sorry, Nate, could you please make me interpreter or whoever is host? Yeah, I'm just looking for the... Um, thank you so much. Because I'm sharing my screen right now and I'm trying to find the... Um, I really can't, I don't see it here. No worries. Okay, the other option is Weber, will you, okay, will you be okay interpreting yeah, I can, I the rest? Sure. Okay, let's do that. Thank you so much. Actually, yeah, so whoever can start taking over. Thank you. We can go back. Actually, I, I found it. So if you want me to. Oh, okay, you, yes, or, yes, would, please. Uh, it will be best. Yeah, whoever has been doing a, a long run and so did Carla. Oops. So thank you. It's the one that says language leader, right? Yes, correct. Okay. Um, thank you so much. Yeah, just one second. Gracias, Abby. Gracias. Is that working? The... Oh, yeah, I'm going to go back to it. I just want to make sure it's oh, working because I got to get off the screen share to. Um... Hey, Natalia, could you let me know if um... maybe she can't? I can try to help, Nate. Can you ask her? And I'm just going to uh, screen share again, maybe. Oh. I'm going to direct message her. Thanks, everybody, for bearing with us. I don't know if you've read okay. in the chat that this is a great example of what we are talking about when we're talking about um, building a movement across all lines of division that it's really worth taking the time to make sure that we can all participate. So thank you for hanging okay, in there. Uh, I think I think everything's ready to continue with the presentation. I think we're good. Is this the right slide? Yes, thank you. Um, the last slide here, and so just to say this, this last point is just that the, the Affordable Care Act really continued a lot of a lot of these same trends. The healthcare marketplaces were yet another place where public dollars flowed into the hands of pockets of uh, healthcare profiteers, first to private insurers and then to providers, and then the rise in high deductible plans means that more people are that people are still avoiding primary care and, and only coming to healthcare providers when that when their health condition has elevated to the level of emergency. And Medicaid expansion you know, in the states where that, that has happened is it's meant a huge difference for, for working poor adults in particular. But the state by state nature of it means that places where that hasn't expanded and um, you know a lot of parts of the South and parts of the Midwest that continues to be a place where um, uh, low wage workers are kind of driven to just find whatever they can get um, and, and work uh, work their way into being able to afford health care instead of having that that expansion and, and really you know, knowing that this is oftentimes a life and death struggle for health care in those states where Medicaid expansion has been blocked. Um, and then also further the austerity and, and commodification logic uh, around health care, particularly by introducing things like accountable care organizations. Um, that, that are further the trend of Medicaid being outsourced and managed by private uh, corporations that are trying to look to ration care and cut costs, which tend to disproportionately impact elders and people with disabilities. And healthcare inequity is on the rise. Um, hospitals in poor rural and urban areas continue to close down, even now during the, the pandemic, um, creating uh, you know, more and more healthcare deserts, as the way one person I heard describe it. Um, and on the flip side of this, we have a full half of the U.S. covered by public insurance programs between Medicare, Medicaid, the VA, the CHIP programs. And during COVID alone, 10 million people have enrolled in Medicaid. So are just going to visualize that about half the country. That's like, you know, the 140 million we talk about in the Poor People's Campaign are all depending on public funding. And yet all that 
that public, so much of that public money is going into the hands of healthcare profiteers. And public spending on healthcare is one of the few areas that's seen steady growth over the past 50 years, while other sections of, of um, the kind of social safety net have been slashed and burned, whether that's food, housing, all these other things that are also our human rights. Um, so I'll leave it there and, and, and pass it back to Bruce for, for time for a couple comments or discussion. And appreciate you, get, you all um, bearing with me. I, I tend to talk fast of the previous presentation were probably like five minutes shorter because I was going a mile a minute. So thanks for being with me. I really, really appreciate getting to share this. With no worries, Avery, no worries. A uh, lot of information. Um, I want to know, when we want to know what people that are participating with us tonight, what you're thinking. How did this history that Avery presented, how did it make you feel? You can just unmute yourself. This is open to anybody and everybody. Hey, Bruce, this is Michael. I had a, actually a question for Avery about this. I mean, it made me feel, it's, you know, certainly angry. This is not the way that this, we don't need a system like this. We need something that, you know, the, the money goes to help people, not in the pockets of uh, profiteers. And so I'm curious, as people talk about universal, uh, some sort of universal healthcare system, and we may be far away from it, or it might be something that's just around the corner, I'm wondering the role of having it sort of distributed public and private insurance to one universal healthcare system. What's the role that labor and unions can play in moving us in this direction? Because it seems to me that for labor, it's a bargaining chip that they have with their workers, the people that they're representing, to say that we've gotten you this, this great health insurance and you don't want to go to this, you know, they may, you know, not look favorably toward a federal insurance, um, a federal health care plan that removes this opportunity for them to have a bargaining chip with, with, um, with you know, and the interaction with workers and with uh, managers. So what, what can labor do to, to change, to perhaps change their, the, the tone there, if that makes sense? I mean, I, I can share a quick thought on that. And just would love to hear other people's thoughts. I mean, I know um, the, tr the, the bargaining chip is also true on the other side. Like the em employers um, increasingly, you know, like, well, we're not going to give you a raise because it's all going into this growing expensive health healthcare plan. And I noticed that as, as an example in, in Vermont, the public, our public teachers are actually pretty well paid in Vermont and, and uh, uh, the largest union in Vermont. And they, like so many other people on private plans, are now seeing the growth of like high deductible plans, and it's becoming a real crisis for them. So I think it's, um, you know, it's, it's it's all getting tipped away, and I think it's um, more and more. Even even the most Cadillac healthcare insurance is is being risked uh, and and chipped away at. Um, but I also think that you know, in in a lot of cases, it might it's, it's going to be the non viable Medicaid. I mean, it's going to be the poor and dispossessed to lead lead the way because there are. That, you know, there's some unions that might be stuck in that that kind of mindset of like, oh no, we don't want to give up our our health insurance. But honestly, more more and more union members I know are like, oh my God, if we didn't have to deal with that every time we came to the bargaining table, right. that would be so great. Okay, thanks for your wonderful presentation. Really appreciate it. Some people have been commenting on chat. <clears throat> maybe that'll I'll read some of those, and maybe that'll inspire someone to speak up too. Um, our healthcare systems are nonprofit, supposedly. <laughs> Sad, everything is about money. Isn't that the truth? How would you feel if healthcare wasn't all about money? How would that make you feel? You mean if it was about people instead of money? That would make me feel really good. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Healthy. Femi says it would make me feel healthy. Yes. That's like, awesome. That's right. Then the focus of healthcare would be about care and not money. Not even just care, but preventative care because. Excuse me, that's the one thing we miss in this country. Every, like you said, everybody goes to the doctor after they're in dire circumstances. What we need to push for is preventative care, which would save all of us a lot of money and keep people healthier. But 
our system has become a system of fixing people instead of preventing it from happening in the first place. That's right, Cindy. And I think also the, I, mean, I had a wonderful discussion earlier this evening with Sally from Edgerton about the notion of you know children, um, just mental health care being covered broadly, but children's mental health, that's really important. And that's something that has to be covered. And for my experience, uh, I've been in, I was in healthcare for over 30 years, and my experience was with all that the poorest care is the most costliest care uh, due to fragmentation, the emphasis on making money and seeing more and more people than not spending the time or coordinating and addressing the total needs of people. That's what a for profit system did to my patients. And the more money they spent, it seemed like the worst they got. This is such an awesome discussion, but I'm gonna um, help us. We have a lot, a, a lot more sharing to do tonight, and we want to talk about this week of action so that we can talk about what we're doing. So, um, I'm gonna be the timekeeper nudger. Do we want to move into that one minute break, or should we move forward to the week of action, Sarah? Um. Nati, can you type in the chat? Should we do a one minute break or should we? The, the one minute break, we're gonna. Okay, we can keep going. Okay. Thank you. Well, yeah, I'm delighted uh, to next introduce uh, Nishmi Jarenko from the Nonviolent uh, Medicaid Army to discuss their planned week of action. Great. Can you all hear me? Yes, thank you. Awesome, thank you for having me. Um, it's a little late here um, in, in Philly, so I'll try to be coherent. Um, yeah, so I'm Nijmi, I'm, I'm the co-chair of the Pennsylvania Poor People's Campaign. I'm a member of the National Steering Committee of the Poor People's Campaign along with Avery. And um, I guess I'll talk just very briefly about where the nonviolent Medicaid Army comes from and then about the week of action. So the nonviolent Medicaid army uh, was kind of born here in Pennsylvania. We were inspired by the work of the Vermont Workers Center and um, their Medicaid marches that they had started to do. And we uh, came up with this concept of the nonviolent Medicaid army based on the concept of the nonviolent army of the poor that Dr. King talked about in the first Poor People's Campaign. And we always intended for the nonviolent Medicaid army to be a vehicle for the whole country to uh, really organize the poor and dispossessed, the 140 million that we talk about in the Poor People's Campaign and to try to organize this, this uh, group of people, this massive group of people who, as we know, are the most disorganized and unorganized on purpose. It's not an accident. We're kept in a state of disorganization in a state of unorganization and also in a state of disunity. And the nonviolent Medicaid army is attempting to take what is objectively something that is unifying millions of people in this country and that's being either on Medicaid or excluded from Medicaid, right? There are also millions of people who should be, uh, have Medicaid who are excluded from it. To take that objective reality and really make people conscious of it in such a way that it becomes a uniting factor and something to organize around. And we found in Pennsylvania, in Vermont and other states that healthcare can be a very strategic issue to bring people together who have been pitted against each other traditionally because we all relate to it. We all have experiences with it. We all have a need for it. And so it can do um, the work of uniting us across urban and rural divides, across racial divides, across uh, immigrant and citizen divides and all kinds of other ones. And as Avery has um, shown us as well, um, healthcare is a place where the ruling class is still heavily investing their capital. 
And so, um, but at the same time, they have no solutions for us. Uh, neither of the two parties really is, is putting forth a solution. We're 18 months into a global pandemic and there has been no expansion of healthcare, um, significant expansion of healthcare in this country. Healthcare has not been declared a right, nor housing or water or other things either. So what the nonviolent Medicaid army uh, is trying to do is also to make connections between these issues because if you are on or excluded from Medicaid, chances are you're also facing every other front of struggle, be it housing, be it mass incarceration, be it the failed immigration system, uh, be it the lack of uh, living wages, education, et cetera. So if you're in the nonviolent Medicaid army, you automatically have a lens into all of these different fronts of struggle and a way of, of also connecting them too. Um, this is the second year of the week of action and it's great, it's already started. I just came from an action in Philadelphia. Um, there are actions happening in California, in Texas, in Wyoming, in Wisconsin, of course, um, in uh, Florida, New York, Pennsylvania, Vermont. And um, it's, you know, a, one of the things that, that is happening through this week of action is folks building a shared analysis. Um, and also uh, among of, of many of the things that um, Sarah and Natalia um, spoke about earlier, right? Political independence, what does that really mean? Um, this helps us be politically independent because we can see that it's not really in the program of either party to solve the healthcare crisis actually. Um, so we, we maintain our political independence through this. We build leadership, the leadership of the poor and dispossessed. Um, and we, we can unite um, the class across lines of division. So that's what this week is about in a longer arc of organizing. It's not just a mobilization, it's really about organizing strategy um, to really, uh, as Sarah had said earlier, um, work for the kind of long-term change that we really need. So that's what it is and excited that um, there's so many awesome actions happening in Wisconsin and we're totally here to support you and to work together with you. So thank you. All right, so I think we're gonna jump Michael in. Michael is, Michael is muted. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry about that. Thank you, Nijmi. And we're not going to discuss the Poor People's Campaign Plan Week of Action here in Wisconsin. There should be time for a few questions. Please put them in the chat and we'll address them shortly. I turn this over to Moses. Awesome. Hi, everyone. My name is Moses and I'm really excited to be kind of facilitating um, everyone kind of talking about their actions around the state. Um, things will be happening all across Wisconsin on Saturday, September 18th. And so I just want to note that in addition to the places we mentioned, participants of all ages anywhere in Wisconsin are invited to take part by chalking wherever you live. And Justice is going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, to my lovely presenters, we're um, a little short on time. So I um, am going to try my best to stick you to one minute, if that's okay. Um, if I have to cut you off, um, I apologize. Um, but I just wanna make sure that everyone gets heard. So first I'm gonna pass it to Brittany and Wasa. Hey everyone. Um, so in, in Wasa, Bruce and I are um, going to be hosting a event called Chalk and Talk. Um, it, we chose to do an at-home event. Um, Bruce is going to be out of town. Um, so we didn't want to overwhelm anybody, AKA me, um, trying to do something alone on Saturday. 
Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to have um, goodie bags. We're going to provide chalk for everybody. Um, and then people will sign up online. Um, Bruce and I are going to deliver bags on Friday to anybody who is interested in participating. Um, and then Saturday, I am going to go around, well, probably between Saturday and Sunday, go around and take pictures of everybody's artwork, um, send it to Moses. And we are also going to try to get some stories as well from people. I'm under awesome. a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Brittany. Perfect. Um, next, we'll pass it to Abigail in Milwaukee. Hola, mi nombre es Abigail. Hi, my name is Abigail. Abigail. I'm part of a group called United Neighbors in Milwaukee. We're going to have a event for the whole community. We're going to try doing events called uh, harvesting. The end of harvesting. In, 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 in our garden, we have um, tomatoes, onions, pumpkins, and it's all for the neighbors. So we're going to be celebrating the end of harvest season. We're going to cook chicken with vegetables from the garden for everybody, for the whole community. We'll have music, raffles. We're going to organize a art table as well uh, for the kids. And we're all going to focus on how, how, what would our vision be as people, as families, as communities, if we all had access to, to health care, if that was a human right. This event we're going to celebrate on Saturday, the 18th of September. And thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and now we'll pass it to Sally in Janesville. Actually, Sally um, was having internet troubles. So I'll just tell everybody real quick in case you're tuning in from Janesville that um, the Janesville group will be at the Janesville Farmers Market, um, chalking, collecting healthcare stories, um, sharing information about resources, and doing free blood pressure checks. So um, if you're in Janesville or know folks in Janesville, please. Um, send them over to the nonviolent Medicaid Army table at the Janesville Farmers Market this weekend. Saturday, eight to one. Perfect. And then we will pass it to Cindy in Appleton. Hello, I'm not doing Friday or Saturday. I cannot do Saturday. So I'm doing Friday at our Houdini Square, which is sort of our main little congregating square in downtown Appleton. I will be doing that Friday from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. And so we will be basically doing a rally and also a chalk and talk. So we'll be passing out flyers, we'll have signs and we'll be chalking downtown where people will see it. And we can ask passerbys if they'd like to chalk something on the sidewalk as to why this is important to them. So we're doing our event on Friday. Perfect. And then we'll pass it to Femi in Milwaukee. Yeah, so hey y'all. Um... Kevin and I and the rest of the squad are excited um, about just the opportunity to serve our community. And so we'll be in Red Arrow Park, also known as Dontre Hamilton Park, very divided area as far as hardship and struggle. Um, and we'll center it around just healthcare for all and access and the issues of mental health um and just the many ways that um our city struggles with police brutality and access of health care and mental health and all these things um that are pulling at us in many ways and so we'll be doing a chalk and talk um family friendly come on out um wherever you are so yeah join us five to six thirty on saturday Perfect. And then lastly, we're going to pass it to Justice, who's going to talk a little bit about 
um, what you can do if you can't make it to any of these actions or if you live in an area that is far from one of these actions and how you can participate from home. Hi everyone, my name is, like Moses said, Justice. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, and so I am currently running the Wisconsin Poor People's Campaign Instagram account. Um, and so if you are at these events and you are posting, if you could please use the hashtag WIPPC and NVMA, I will also put this in the chat for accessibility um, <laughs> after I've been talking and hashtag WIPPC. Um, Hashtags are very complicated to explain, but just in a nutshell, um, if you post this and use this hashtag, the people that engage in our posts will most likely see what you've been posting as well. Also, if you are posting um, and you can also just tag Wisconsin's Poor People's Campaign, I will put the notification and kind of um, uplift the images and the messages from there as well. Um, and if you want to interact and you are doing a virtual, feel free to interact with like commenting, um, also sharing this information um, on your social media, if you have Instagram, um, cause that's where I'm focusing on right now. Awesome. Um, and then I will also put my email in the chat, which is where you can send photos to if you're doing something at home. So in addition, um, I can help out Justice with that as well. Um, so I'll put my email in the chat. But we are going to wrap things up now. We thank you guys for staying just a couple minutes. And I believe I'm passing it to Natalia. I don't know who I'm passing it through. Sorry. <laughs> can people hear me? No, because I'm an interpreter. Oh, because I'm an English channel. Yeah, actually, Abigail is going to do it. I, I can't be heard in every channel. So Moses, could you pass it to Abby, please? Thank you. Yeah, perfect. So we're going to pass it to Abigail to um, close this out with our chant. Okay. Uh, quiero agradecer a todos los líderes por hacer... all the leaders for making this meeting possible especially to Michael and Bruce and to the interpreters, I'd like to thank Weber and Carla and to Nate for running Zoom. And I'd like to thank everyone, all the, everyone who attended. I'd like to thank everyone for, for being here. And to close, we're gonna go with a chant. I'll say, I'll say forward together, we all repeat, not one step back. Or juntos pa'lante, ni un paso atrás. Ni un paso atrás. Ni un paso atrás. Juntos pa'lante. Ni un paso atrás. Muchas gracias a todos. Muchas gracias. De nada. Muchas gracias, Abby. Gracias a todos. Have a great night, everyone. Um, if, if you're not sure how to plug in, please fill out the Get Involved form that we just posted um, or email us at Wisconsin at Poor People's Campaign. We need all of you, so we'll find a role for you to help out. So please connect with us if you're not already. Gracias.